This is a starship waiting in orbit for another starship to arrive and perform a refueling operation. We can already see several differences compared to the current standard starship design. One of the most noticeable features is the large solar panels. So, let's take a closer look and figure out what's going on here. First, let's talk about Starship's solar arrays. This is a key component for future deep space missions. Solar arrays will be a standard feature on long-duration versions of Starship, as shown in many of the human landing system concept visuals. This capability is critical for any spacecraft expected to operate beyond Earth orbit, where reliable and renewable power is essential. In the HLS concept, these solar arrays will serve as the lander's primary source of energy, both in space and on the lunar surface. During launch, each array is stowed within a rectangular compartment located beneath the crew cabin. Depending on the final design chosen by SpaceX, the panels will either unfold or unroll to a deployed length of approximately 18 meters. The five panels are arranged 30 degrees apart in a hexagonal pattern, with one panel intentionally omitted. This gap provides an unobstructed view of the lunar surface for Starship's commander and pilot during descent and also allows for the deployment of the crew elevator that will lower astronauts to the surface. While the human landing system is in orbit around the Earth or the Moon, the solar arrays will be positioned perpendicular to the spacecraft's propellant tanks. Starship will orient its nose toward the Sun, allowing all five panels to maximize energy collection. It's possible that the arrays will be retracted during landing to prevent damage from vibrations or debris kicked up by the engines, although this detail is not confirmed in current renderings. Once Starship is on the lunar surface, the arrays will rest vertically along the body of the lander. At the moon's south pole, where Artemis III is targeting, the sun hovers low on the horizon. This vertical orientation will optimize solar exposure and maximize energy generation. Notably, this configuration likely offers a larger total surface area than the smaller cylindrical array shown in earlier Starship concepts. This could suggest that the lander's power requirements have increased. The additional power may be used to support the 450 kilograms of scientific instruments aboard Artemis III, operate cryocoolers to extend the storage time of liquid oxygen and methane, or serve other critical systems. Some sources also indicate that deployable solar arrays of this kind are already under development. According to those reports, the same compartments that house the solar panels will also contain six communications antennae spaced in a hexagonal pattern between the arrays. These multiple communications systems will enable Starship to stay in contact with Earth, Orion, astronauts on the surface, and eventually the Gateway Space Station in lunar orbit. There have been many creative and speculative renders of Starship's solar panels over the years. But as much as SpaceX enjoys innovating, there are some technologies in spaceflight, like solar panels, that are already well-proven and reliable. So, there is also a high chance that it would likely be on something very similar to the solar arrays used on Crew Dragon, but modified for Starship. They may look boring, but they're tested, durable, and effective. If SpaceX can adapt existing, proven solar technology and instead focus its efforts on more complex systems such as cryogenic refueling, life support, and propulsion, it just makes sense. When you're going to the Moon or Mars, reliability is everything. Anyway, the first use of Starship's solar array is expected during the Starship propellant transfer demonstration, scheduled to take place sometime in 2026. The mission will begin with a standard launch. The Super Heavy Booster lifts the upper stage into orbit, then returns to the launch site for a catch attempt. Up to this point, the flight closely resembles a typical test. However, this time the upper stage will remain in orbit instead of returning. It will stay aloft for three to four weeks, awaiting the arrival of a second starship, which will conduct the fuel transfer. To survive this extended period in space, the waiting starship will be fitted with an enhanced power system and expanded battery storage. Once in orbit, it will adjust its orientation for thermal control and deploy solar panels from internal storage. After deployment, the vehicle will vent all tanks except for the attitude control system tank. This procedure reduces internal pressure and lowers the risk of overpressurization or leaks during its stay in orbit. Since the main tanks are no longer needed for propulsion, 
If all goes according to plan, the Chaser vehicle, a starship acting as a refueling tanker, will launch on schedule. Once in orbit, the two starships will rendezvous and autonomously dock, aligning belly to belly as they fly a few hundred miles above Earth. This docking procedure should be no more complex than a Crew Dragon capsule linking with the International Space Station. After docking, fuel lines either connect automatically or must be manually secured using flexible hoses and fluid couplings. SpaceX has extensive experience with this kind of hardware. The real challenge lies in transferring cryogenic propellants such as liquid oxygen and methane in microgravity. Cryogenic fuel transfer in space is notoriously difficult. Traditionally, these operations were envisioned to occur at large orbital depots. In zero gravity, however, managing the behavior of cryogenic fluids becomes a major engineering challenge. Without gravity, fluids float freely inside tanks, making it difficult to control flow, measure remaining fuel, and maintain stable pressure. A promising solution is to apply low levels of thrust during the transfer. This small amount of acceleration creates a pseudo-gravity effect helping the liquid settle at the bottom of the tank and separating it from vapor. This approach is based on Newtonian physics. In orbit, when a spacecraft accelerates, the liquid inside resists the motion and collects at the rear of the tank. By placing an outlet valve at this location, the fluid can be made to flow as if gravity were acting on it. Even with a large spacecraft like Starship, this method could be very effective. With large enough plumbing between the vehicles, it may be possible to transfer more than 1,000 tons of propellant in just a few hours. According to Elon Musk, almost 80% oxygen is transferred in this process, only a little over 20% fuel. Once the transfer is complete, the final steps are relatively simple. Valves are closed, couplings are disconnected, and the two ships move apart using small thrusters before firing the main engine again. Any remaining liquid in open pipes will boil off harmlessly into space. Under the current plan, SpaceX can use a single launch pad to support both the tanker and mission vehicle flights. However, by the time NASA and SpaceX are ready for a lunar landing, multiple Starship tankers will likely launch from at least two pads to deliver propellant to an orbital depot. This depot will then supply the moonbound starship. So, instead of requiring each tanker to dock directly with a lander, habitat, or interplanetary probe, the propellant is first collected at the depot. The mission vehicle then launches, docks once with the depot, receives a full fuel load, and proceeds on its journey. This method is safer, more efficient, and reduces the time-sensitive payloads spent in low Earth orbit. That matters because LEO is increasingly crowded and not ideal for extended stays with delicate cargo. But how many flights are actually required to fully fuel a starship? To fully refuel a starship in low Earth orbit, Elon Musk has estimated that around eight tanker flights would be required. Each of these launches would deliver approximately 150 tons of propellant adding up to the 1,200 tons needed for a full load. This assumes that each tanker can carry its maximum fuel capacity and that the Starship being refueled is topped off completely. Some sources suggest the actual number could be higher, possibly exceeding 10 flights. Others estimate that for a partial refueling, such as for a lunar mission, only about four tanker launches might be needed. In truth, the exact number is still uncertain. It will ultimately depend on how well Starship performs in practice and how optimally efficient the tanker variant turns out to be. But wait, there's one more challenge. My fuel seems to be slowly leaking away. Space is both extremely hot and incredibly cold, making the storage of cryogenic propellants, like those used by Starship, liquid oxygen, and liquid methane, a serious engineering challenge. Despite the space's frigid environment, these fuels can still evaporate. Methane boils at negative 161 degrees Celsius and oxygen at negative 253 degrees Celsius. That's why starships are fueled just minutes before launch and why we see those dramatic clouds of steam billowing from them. It's the cryogenic fuel venting off as it warms. Managing these fuels in space is even harder. 
the underlying science of cryogenic phase, changes, and fluid behavior in microgravity is still not fully understood. The available experimental data are limited and inconsistent. This lack of understanding becomes a big problem when planning long-duration missions, like the six- to eight-month journey to Mars, where significant fuel losses could occur. So what can we do? One solution could be hitting the subscribe button. Just kidding, that won't help Starship but it will help us reach our goal of 10,000 subscribers, so please consider. Seriously though, one approach to minimize cryogenic boil-off in space combines better technology with smarter system-level design. Boil-off is driven by two main factors, heat leakage and the amount of fuel in the tank. Smaller tanks lose a higher percentage of fuel because of the cube square law. Surface area, which leaks heat, scales with the square of the size, while volume, which holds fuel, scales with the cube. To put it in numbers, modern tank designs can achieve very low boil-off rates. Liquid hydrogen tanks have reached as low as 0.13% per day, or about 3.8% per month. For the higher boiling point liquid oxygen, losses can be as little as 0.016% per day, roughly 0.5% per month. But even these low rates become a serious issue on long missions. Space isn't empty. It radiates heat, and spacecraft structures conduct it. Even the best thermal insulation, like multi-layer insulation, can't completely stop this. Over time, this heat causes the fuel to vaporize, increasing tank pressure. To prevent dangerous overpressurization, the gas is vented, which means valuable fuel is lost. Additional losses occur during transfer operations, where propellant is used to cool down tanks and plumbing. All of this waste makes current cryogenic storage systems a major bottleneck for deep space missions like crewed trips to Mars. One promising solution is Zero Boil-Off ZBO, or Reduced Boil-Off ERBO technology. These systems use active control methods to keep tank pressure stable without losing fuel. ZBO approaches rely on complex techniques that involve both energy removal and propellant mixing. These mechanisms only work well in microgravity if carefully engineered. Although dynamic ZBEO systems are more complicated than passive insulation-based approaches, they offer major advantages. For example, a study of one nuclear-powered Mars mission concept found that a large liquid hydrogen tank carrying 38 tons of propellant would lose around 16 tons per year through passive boil-off. That is nearly half the fuel lost before even arriving at Mars. In short, Making long-duration spaceflight feasible, especially for human missions, requires a leap forward in cryogenic fuel management.